Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum for this, uh, for this two-week period. It is Wednesday, May the 9th. I'd like to start by thanking the volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program possible every two weeks. Our guest in this segment is Eric Anderson, and we're going to be talking about, I guess you could call it the disastrous mess at BC Hydro. And the province. And the province. So if you can start by talking about the scale of provincial contractual obligations. This is money that we owe that nobody ever talks about, but we owe it. It's called contractual obligations. It's money we have contracted mainly to pay to buy hydro that we don't need from a lot of very happy corporations. Well, thanks, Jack. Uh, it's not just, uh, these numbers are not just for hydro. They make, hydro makes up a, a very large portion of the number. Uh, out of the uh, over 100 billion, uh, before they uh, figured in uh, add in site C, it's uh, about uh, 60 billion for uh, BC Hydro under this obligation. So if you're looking at that, uh, at that chart, on the left is British Columbia, and we're at 90 billion dollars. No, no, oh, sorry. No, no. sorry. Uh, we're looking at 90,000 per ah, family of four. Now, I only bring it down to uh, describing it as a personal thing because we're not limited liability companies like a lot of other people are limited liabilities uh, allows them to escape responsibility. In the end, they can go bankrupt. But in the case of families who have property here and are living here, making a living and ha hope to carry on, they are on the hook. And for a family of four in BC, it's $90,000 as of 2017. And we can see Quebec is next, which is surprising. They're, they're at 47000 or 48000 But if you take out Quebec and you look at Ontario, look at the difference between oh, us it's and, huge. and... Yeah. And if you add in Site C, which is abomination of the worst order, that number of 89,000 goes to uh, 100,000. So that's $100,000 in total contractual obligations for a family of four. Four, in living in BC. Right, right. So Shocking. If, if we that's, a, that's a mortgage that nobody really processed. And it's worth mentioning that virtually all of this took place under the 15 years of the Liberal governments of Gordon Campbell Virtually and all. Uh, Christy Clark, where they signed us into deals to buy power from independent power producers that went out and trashed all of our, our rivers to build stuff we didn't need. And we're on the hook now for $90,000 for a family, $190,000 for a family of four to pay for this yep. over many, many years. Um, and nobody even knows, it's all kept secret. Unfortunately, uh, all the contracts for independent power producers are secret. I've tried the uh, BC Utilities Commission for a copy of a couple of the contracts and I'm shut right down. So uh, they are secret for the public. So let's show people the amount of total liabilities that BC Hydro has right now in terms of billions of dollars. That's, which include these contractual... That's this one here. Okay. Um, well, in if, 2000... If we look at the top, we see... Yeah. It's a, is that a... Can you... What is that number? 101.6 billion uh, dollars. Yeah, that's with inclusion of Site C. So, um, BC Hydro and its customers, who they go for money, unless the BC government magically pulls it away and say, oh no, you don't have to pay that, we'll pay it. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's over a hundred billion. Okay. So that is total liabilities of, of BC Hydro customers, a hundred billion dollars, that's us. That's us. Shocking, eh? Do you feel that vacation, vacating wallet syndrome? <laughs> well, I, I, I feel like uh, it's interesting this is done in secret. Where's the media and where are the politicians? Why isn't anybody, you know, over the years while this was built well, up? Well, there's a little history there, and I'll be quick. Uh, about 
12 years ago when somebody wanted to build a uh, generation site at Duke Point. It was public. The contract was public. It went through the Public Utilities Commission and we all got to look at it. And uh, BC Hydro and the Utilities Commission passed on the contract. The minute we won the right to bring it into a real court of law, not that kangaroo thing over in the BC Utilities, they all ran away. And then suddenly, Mr. Campbell and his cabinet decided they needed secret documents. And that's when it happened. So from there, uh, as you can see, in 2005, the uh, total obligations for BC Hydro and the BC Hydro customers to pay now was a little over 10 chart? billion. That's that's this chart? No, this one here. Okay. Still on this one. Okay. And, uh, and now we're at uh, shooting for 100. Oh, I see. The purple line is 2005. Yeah. The purple line is 2005, and the red line is where we're at now. Yeah, it's a shocking line. You know, as I said earlier, the liberals are portrayed by the media as the party of good sense and good business and they're taking care of people's money and that's why a lot of people vote for them but if you look at these two numbers you'll see that they have added um, 90 billion dollars in in long-term debt current liabilities etc okay. in a period of just in a period of just uh, 12 years yeah. all in secret and Christy Clark and you know Gordon Campbell is our, our representative to the British court. He's doing great. Christy, I'm sure, is very happy. And look what they've done to us. And the NDP was silent through the whole thing. The media was silent. They were indeed. And they knew. Mr. Horrigan and his crew knew this information because Rafe Mayer and I made it very clear by email to them directly what was going on. And uh, they were silent. What did they say back to you when you sent them? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Well, folks, that's where we're at. Do you do you want to go into these numbers a little bit? Uh, uh, no, it's it's it, they're just a summation of what's on the record. All this is on the record, so we're not we're not creating things out of thin but air. But this hundred and if we look at the chart again, 2017, yeah. we're up to 101 billion dollars, including Site C. That is 10.5 billion at the top for Site C. Probably a lot more than that. Uh, 58 billion for contractual obligations. Obligations, yeah. And uh, before that, and 22 billion of long-term debt. So we should be at the 33 billion. Yes. But because of the contractual obligations for power, we don't need. And because of Site C, we're at 101 billion dollars. Thank you, Christy, Gordon, John, the media, and all the rest, for this massive uh, attack on us. So. Uh once again, from the record, it's just worth pointing out that uh, in the course of 2005 to 2017, there's been zero change in the amount of uh, energy that domestic users, customers, residential and commercial in BC have needed, as reported by BC Hydro. The population in the province in that period went up 14%. And the consumption of by residential customers went up 14%. So they basically ponied up the money they had to pay. Uh, light uh, industrial and commercial, they dropped down their consumption because they were responding to higher rates and going higher. And in the, in the case of heavy industrial, they really cut back because the world needed to cut back on basic commodities. And that's what happened. They're a, they're a taker of the world. Not, they don't make things. BC does not make prices or volumes. They are a taker, producer or taker. And then the last, uh, sales to others. Those are people who um, are able to get in and buy uh, BC Hydro's surplus energy. Um, it's about six and a half, seven and a half thousand gigawatt hours a year, which is roughly uh, 12 to 15 percent of total need for the province. And those customers don't pay 
the same rates that people inside the monopoly that we know as BC Hydro have to pay. They pay the market rate in North America. I noticed that they went up 400%. Well, that's because BC Hydro was trying to do something for cash. They had to find cash, so sell at any price. That's what you do. And just to uh, illustrate the price differences, in that period of 05 to 17, the residential rates went up 73%, commercial 71%, and industrial nearly 70%. 67 exactly and uh, I think that uh, they're just that's just an example of abuse of monopoly status the pricing is is an abuse of monopoly monopoly privilege now where it's going to go from here that's an interesting question well let me ask you that question where is it going to go from here because we uh, BC Hydro is deeply in debt um, I, I assume the goal is to privatize it. Well, I don't know if that's a specific goal that anyone's going to uh, uh, validate. Uh, it's pure speculation. Um, that's what happened over at, uh, in Ontario. Uh, they, that's right. They in ran Ontario. into uh, what I call a, a coffin corner, which is uh, in, in the pilot's world, is when you lose altitude and flying speed all at the same time, and you've got nowhere to go but a crash. And I think BC Hydro is in that kind of condition. So Ontario Hydro, which used to be publicly owned, yeah. has now been partially privatized. Pri partially, right? yeah. Fifty percent or? About that. About that. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, this great crown jewel that we once had, you know, the, the plunderers want to get their hands on it. And thanks to our governments, uh, it looks like they're maybe close. Well, there's a, this is speculation, uh, but uh, I view what has happened as deliberate. And uh, you, if you look at it from a buyer's point of view, the way you get, create a buyer's market, which is the rest of North America, or especially West Coast, West side of North America, you, you encourage overproduction and overinvestment. And then the producer, BC Hydro and BC, they, they have to sell because they've got such an obligation, financial obligation, they have to meet. So they'll sell at any price. And as a buyer, you say, bring it on. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're the fools. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. We're, we're well into the fool. Don't okay, fool so me. we now have an NDP government. We have one minute left. What should a good government do? First off, it's a slam dunk. They should stop spending on Site C. Yes. We don't need, at this time, the electrical energy that they are projecting from that site at the price they're projecting it to be, which is way out of line. All across Canada, we got examples of people getting it wrong, and we're just following in their slipstream. Stupid. Okay, that sounds like a good totally start. Totally ignorant. What about the contractual obligations? Uh, well. Theoretically, uh, we shouldn't be paying for something uh, that we don't need. And so it would be nice to think that we could open those contracts and, and renegotiate them or back out of them. But uh, I think that the likelihood is it would be very, very difficult. And so I would say that the provincial government should or has to take those contracts and put it on the general taxpayer and not the customers of BC Hydro. It's still us. Oh, we're out of time. Okay. Eric, thank you very much. Folks, this <laughs> is a really an unbelievable situation that we're in. We got to do better. Thank you very much for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. It's still Wednesday, May the 9th. Yes. Um, it's myself and Walt, and we're going to be talking with Mehdi Najari. And Walt, what are we starting off with? Well, um, you know, we, we're looking at a lot of issues here in BC, you know, and, and the two big ones that we're really pressing upon us, of course, is the Site C Dam, which is not resolved, by the way, in any stretch. And, of course, the Kinder Morgan Pipeline, which is getting stranger and stranger as we, as we go, as uh, 
uh, as we look at the shenanigans of Kinder Morgan and all that. Um, and uh, Mehdi and I just had a brief chat before before the show, and, and I think I think what we were seeing is that you know we were kind of looking at the NDP of maybe there's a chance, maybe they're going to save us from some of this, but you know Mehdi mentioned that really the the, the political dichotomy between the liberal Socred regime and the NDP is really a false dichotomy that really everything they do shows us that. It's in their interest to look out after some other people and not look out after the taxpayers and the citizens of this province. So um, maybe we could start out there, Mehdi, and, and maybe you could just give us some examples of why, why you think that the, there is no real dichotomy between the, the Liberals and the NDP. I, I came to this country in 1987, to this province, and uh, I remember very vividly in 1988-89, the NDP leader at that time, Mr. Uh, Mark Hartcourt, were going around and telling uh, people of this province that uh, there is a half a billion dollar cost overrun of Coca-Cola Highway. And if we come to power, we are going to have a public inquiry to find out what's happened to the public money. Where, where, where has it gone? You know, half a billion dollar co cost overrun. When they came to power in 1991, we didn't have that inquiry. So they let, let, let them get away with the corruption of, that was in that project. In, night, in 2001, when the liberal came to power, before that day, Mr. Campbell, Gordon Campbell, were going around and saying that we had a cost overrun under the NDP government of fast ferry fiasco. We, when we come to power, we are going to have a public inquiry to find out what's happened with the public money. They came to power, no public inquiry. What's happened? How come these two let each other off the hook? These so-called left and so-called right and for a business party. Then not only he didn't have inquiry for the fast ferry fiasco, he has stopped an inquiry that was proceeding for five, six years under Hartcourt and Glenn Clark government. And then that was bingo gate inquiry. It was already spent $6.5 million of taxpayers' money. Mr. Ka Gordon Campbell stopped it. He then allowed the, the final report be published to tell the citizens what happened with the bingo gate inquiry. And that report would only hurt NDP because it was in, within yeah. NDP. The, the, he has stopped it. Then we had the, during the 16 years of the liberal in power, they had cost overrun of the Surrey hospital, they had cost overrun of the bridges and highways, they had cost overrun of the transmission line to Northwest for a mining interest, $700 million. They had cost overruns and cost overruns over the BC, BC place roof that was leaking and then they build a new one and they start leak again, you know? So we had cost overrun, but no inquiry. These two group, these two choices that the public has, they are both working for the same interest. When they come to power, we see that business, big business interest is being protected and we the public pay for it. So we have to start asking real questions. Do we have choices here in this so-called democ democracy and free society? I say according to my evidence and my experience in the last 30 years, we don't. Uh, in terms of uh, today is the anniversary of uh, uh, NDP coming to power, actually. The last election happened uh, uh, May 6th of last year. So it's the anniversary of the election, the last election. With the side C, Mr. Horrigan said to everyone that he, has, he is going to stop it. He is going to pay at, uh, create energy from the renewable resources. He is going to protect the agricultural land. Or suggest to people, the, your, your, the audience, to go and Google John Horrigan Souk. And see in the meeting in Souk in 2000, December of 2016, how he is adamant that the site C is, is belong to the past, is a kind of uh, uh, outdated project that should not continue, is not in public interest. What does he do? He comes to power in, in uh, 
July 18, he, int he introduced his cabinet. In July 21st of 2017, he promoted Chris O'Reilly, the man that was in charge of building Site C Dam. Under he, he was working Clark. for BC Hydro. He, yeah. he was the vice president yeah. of BC Hydro. He was the man in charge of building this uh, yeah. Site C Dam under Christy Clark. What does he do? He promotes him to the presidency of BC Hydro. And then 11 days later, on August 3rd, he sent the issue of the Site C to Utility Commission. So Utility Commission has to go all around the province to look at uh, to listen to the public, see what the people want and what do they think about Site C. If you are opposing Site C, you don't put a man in charge of building Site C and promoting him to presidency of BC Hydro. Yeah. The problem is nobody knows about this. Yeah. This so-called free media that we have, none of them talk about it. How is it possible? Vaughn Palmer is a capable uh, uh, columnist. Yeah. We have columnists in Times Colonies. We have all these capable reporters. None of them saw it. None of them. It take a stiff, working a stiff like me to see it and, and raise the question. This is incredible. Yeah. So there is something wrong. And <laughs> if we don't, if we don't yes. pay attention, if the public do not pay attention, we are going to be soaked again yeah. and again. We have to add a couple, one, at least one other thing to the list, and that's the, uh, the Imperial Mines disaster at Mount Pauly, that happened under the Liberal regime, those rules and regulations that made it legal, that they never broke any laws. You can, you can cut the top off a mountain and venture that it all run into the lake and uh, nobody, nobody has any problems. Uh, the NDP came into power, they had a chance to actually, you know, go forward with this and do a real investigation. You know, they didn't find the time to do that. They had that. a chance to lay charges they, they, against yeah. the company, provincial charge, and they passed on it. And the media gave them a complete 100% total pass. Oh, yeah. There was not one word of criticism that I remember anywhere in the media when the statute of limitations on the Mount Pauly disaster ha passed and the NDP did nothing. And in fact, a private citizen filed charges. And the government too. later took those charges and, and, the, and ended the, them. The, the yeah. NDP government stopped the private charges, and not only, yeah. and not only they didn't lay charges, they had all the evidence was there that the Mount Pauly company, the mining yeah. company, they intentionally increased the production, and when they were warned again and again, yeah. they ignored it. Yeah. They caused that disaster, yeah. devastating the one of the most uh, 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 pristine, lakes. pristine lake in the world, yeah. one of the deepest and most pristine, they destroyed it. Yeah. But in this province uh, and in this country, the corporate interests take over the public interest. Yeah. When it's come to the b choice between corporations, corp corporate interests and public interests, all these uh, stooges, all these puppets, yeah. either NDP, liberal or conservative, all go for protecting corporate interests against public interests. Maybe, Mehdi, you should mention uh, the, you know, the, the housing crisis we have in BC and, and look at how the foreign investors are driving up the cost of houses in, in this province. Here, here with this so-called housing cri crisis, the, the developers' interests are telling us through Urban Development uh, Institute that we need more housing. We need more housing. This is nonsense. What they have done, they allow the foreigners like me, but uh, what the, the ones that live outside Canada, to yeah. buy homes here in Canada. So when it's a, it's a supply and demand. When you increase the level of demand yeah. a, uh, exponentially, you know, unlimited amount of demand on a very local, very limited local space, yeah. of course, you are going to raise the prices. And what they have done, they they allowed this to happen, and then they, they knew since 2009 that the, that the organized crime are laundering money through the, through the casinos and gambling and, and putting it in the housing. They knew these, all these things. The evidence is clear. There is a Sean Holman uh, report on, in 2010 in Globe and Mail. It's very clear that they knew all these things, but they allowed it to happen. As long as 
they allow the foreigners you know, to buy homes and speculate on, on our, our real estate, we are, we are going to be in this shape. New Zealand and Australia stopped them. Yeah. No problem. Many, many countries in the world do not allow people who are not resident in the country to buy housing. It's absolutely crazy that our governments have done this to us. And the media kept it all secret as the, as the disaster was happening. They just never told us what was going on. In Vancouver, the numbers are somewhere between 45 and 60,000 vacant homes bought by speculators, people outside the country. They've turned our housing market into a casino. People are getting killed because of it. Just the stresses and pressures that are being brought to bear on people and our government and the media and the banks are because people are making fortunes out of it. The 1% of the 1% and they are the ones this country works for. And, and, and we, should, we should say who is benefiting here. Yeah. The banks are benefiting. The realist, realtors and real estate industry is benefiting. The development industry is benefiting. The organized crime yeah. is, 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 is benefiting. Who is losing? Who is paying the cost? Who is the, paying yeah. the public? Yeah. So we see that our government, it bec because what's happened, we have to look at why this is going on. The government is making $2.5 billion on, on property transfer tax. If you take that money out of the budget, you're going to have a big hole. The reason we have a big hole in, in budget is because they gave huge tax cut to corporations. They reduced the corporate taxes since, uh, since the year 2000 from uh, federally from 29% to 15% and provincially from 17% to 10%. Yeah. There is a huge gap is there. So the government, the crooked government are trying to make money as as fast as they can. You know, Mehdi, I would like, like to have you hold up this, this uh, bar graph just to show where our debt in our province has gotten to over the last... See, under, under the business-friendly government, this is when the, when the NDP left, left the, the power in 2001. It was about $35 billion. In total debt. In total debt. Today, the total debt is around $180 billion. This is the friend, business friendly government that know how to run the economy yeah. created. And nobody talk about it. NDP doesn't raise this issue. Mm -hmm. And the people don't know that they are indebted huge amount of money. And they are going to come after us and they want that money. Mm -hmm. And we went from about 35 billion when the NDP left power in 2001 to 100, 100, around 180. 180 billion dollars today. You know, we have just been played and gamed, and uh, it's only getting worse. So somehow we have to regain or gain control of our province. We have to throw off these corporate lunatics who are running things because they are going to destroy us if we don't get rid of them. And, and their media, and their politicians. And we need, we need independent media. We need citizen access to media in order to raise this issue, because without, without program like this, I don't think anybody is talking about it. We, you don't see it in, in, in CFAX. In fact, CFAX has become a, a promoter of the, the pipelines. Every day, they are promoting the pipelines and giving misinformation to public. Mehdi, thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, thanks very much. Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Hi, I'm Eleanor Vannon, and on this segment of Citizens Forum, I'm joined by Ronnie Earnhardt, Chair of Fair Vote Canada's Greater Victoria Chapter. Today we will be discussing proportional representation, the upcoming referendum, and how this relates to women and women's issues. Hi Ronnie, thanks for joining us. Very happy to be here. Now, PR, a lot of people say PR is good for women, that it benefits women. How is that the case? Well, I like to think that PR is good for everybody, but there are some specific ways in which it really helps women and women's issues. I'd like to start with two big general things to keep in mind as we talk about PR and women, and that's um, that PR takes a while. It, it, it's a different form of government, and it's not an instant change overnight. 
It's a whole change in mindset that ends up with better government. So it's a process that takes time, just like the women's movement, movement has taken time to make changes and PR will take time. So uh, don't expect instant results with all the statistics I'll give you. But over time, it tends to uh, represent women's positions better. So one of the most obvious things I can mention right off the bat is the proportion of women in legislatures that are proportional representation systems is significantly higher in those countries that do not have PR. So looking at uh, countries like New Zealand, Germany, uh, Sweden, Norway, they have much higher representation of women. There's sort of a goal of developed countries to have a 30% threshold for elected women. And that's the goal. So in those countries that I just mentioned, they exceed that. And you look at some of the worst countries on the list, and you've got uh, the US coming in at 18%. It's 104th ranked in representation of the women, and uh, it's under the system called First Past the Post, which is our current system. Canada comes in there at 26%. That's federally. I don't know the PC numbers off, off the top of my head. but. Um, there's, there stands to be more improvement. So with more women in government, it leads to different kind of discussion in government. Women have a different emphasis on issues and tend to be more interested in issues of social welfare, like health and education, whereas men traditionally have a somewhat more of an emphasis on other issues such as economics, military issues, and foreign affairs. So it's good in a legislature to have a balance of both positions to, to get a balance in the legislation and in the issues that come up and um, uh, have a little more time at the table for social welfare and women's issues. Now, one of the other things we hear fairly frequently with uh, with PR systems is that it returns a government that operates in a way women find more appealing. Mm -hmm. um, now, how, how does that government operate diff differently? So what we have now under a majoritarian system, winner takes all, is it forces into power one party that may not have uh, the majority of sub popular support by popular vote. So in BC, we very often have a party that only got 39% of the popular vote, but they end up with all the power. So when you shift to a government that's proportional, by definition, the parties are represented according to the, the popular vote. So what that tends to yield is more minority governments where you need to have a coalition of partners to form government. As soon as you go to a coalition government, that changes the way that things work because people have to discuss, they have to agree, you end up with cooperative government, they have to compromise. And that is a style of discourse that tends to be more appealing to women and more comfortable for women to work in. So hence you get more women running as candidates because they're more comfortable working in that kind of a a system than the rather confrontational winner-takes-all system that we have now. So the collaborative nature of coalition or minority governments um, is, is more comfortable to women. They find they'd rather have everyone have some of their needs met some of the time than one party have all of their needs met and have a pendulum that swings back and forth depending on who's in power. That's true and it's simply to even put it a little more simply, it's a question of tone in Parliament. If you go now and you sit in the legislature, there's a lot of mudslinging, there's a lot of name calling, there's, there's just general nastiness and we see it in our newspapers, you see it in the, in the ledge if you bother to go and sit there. Cooperative governments, they don't have time for that. They have to cooperate to get things passed. So the mudslinging kind of goes by the wayside and it produces a more comfortable environment for everybody, but particularly for women, I would say. Well, and certainly the respect issue, I mean, that's key in the women's movement. A lot of the times what women have been asking for is essentially to be treated with dignity and respect. And I can only assume that a political system that has that respect inherent in it would be very appealing to women. Now, the women's movement, we were talking about that. Electoral reform has 
been key in the women's movement for a long time. We see suffrage that was a key and probably the first major issue for many women. Um, what can we learn from the women's movement in terms of continuing with electoral reform? Well, I think, I think there's a lot of parallels to draw between the two. The women's movement has been going on for a long time. Things don't change overnight. Um, and it took a big grassroots, is the word we use now, you know, suffragette was an old, old fashioned word, but it takes um, a big almost uprising of the populace with many, many voices to effect change over the long run. And then change kind of happens in a lot of work, a lot of work, and then there's sort of a, a, a lump change where things change for the better. And then there's a lot of work, a lot of work, and then there's another kind of big change. So I see uh, hopefully the same thing happening in electoral reform. We've gone through a long period of studies and votes, and it's kind of on people's minds, but more in the back of their minds. So I'm hoping that now is the time for one of those step changes where we will have movement with this uh, referendum in, in BC to have a step change towards getting a PR government so we can try it out and see how it works for us. Mm -hmm. And certainly, I mean, one of the parallels I see is people make an appeal to tradition with our current system that, you know, well, this historically is what we've used, so we should continue to use it. Um, I, I personally see that that's very similar to the arguments that were used against women having the right to vote. Um, now, the ballot. I know there's been some questions coming up. Will we get to see the ballot? No one's really sure what's going on. Could you give us an update? Well, I can tell you the, the best that I, I know at the moment. Um, so far, we've gone through our, our period of public consultation. Uh, things are in the hand of, of David Eby's office right now, the Attorney General's office. We're still awaiting the question and the referendum details. There has been uh, information coming out of the NDP party lately saying that they're anticipating a question and some of the rules coming out of David Eby's office in about, uh, in a couple of weeks. So we're anticipating an early June or a June question with a referendum to be completed in, in the fall. Mm. No, that's great. Now, if there was one major thing you could stress to the women of BC, about this upcoming referendum, what bit of information would you like to give them? Uh, I would like to stress, um, make up your own mind. Uh, learn about this PR system. Look at the countries where they've had PR for the longest. And if you look at those countries, they have much higher income, um, higher outcomes on health and education, uh, they have, in addition to more women in power, they have uh, better economic outcomes and they have less income disparity between rich and poor. So I encourage people to go out there and learn things for themselves and uh, become educated on the issue. And I think if they do that, they'll, they'll see some of these big results that are backed up by statistics. It's not just hearsay about the benefits for women. So I posted here on um, the title, uh, if you can go to the website, uh, Fair Vote Canada slash women, there is more information on this subject of specifically how it affects women and um, some studies that back that up. Now you've brought up other countries that already have these mm -hmm. systems. Um, how do they compare to first past the post countries in terms of women's rights? Well, it kind of stands to that uh, if you have more women in legislature, women's rights are going to improve, but it's a gradual process. So as women have more representation, they gain more rights. And if you have less income inequality, women aren't stuck at home. They have public services for childcare and education. It's, there's gains for women all around. So essentially, if women are part of the conversation, their needs are met in a way that they aren't if they're absent from the room. I would say that's fair, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been wonderful talking to you, and, uh, and we'd like to thank Citizens Forum for having us and giving us the time. Um, Ronnie, are there any updates on Fair Vote you'd like to quickly give us? Oh, um, things are a little quiet right now because we're waiting to hear from, 
for the question, just like everybody else in the province. So um, let's stay tuned. All right, great, thank you. And uh, thank you for having us. Welcome back to Citizens Forum, and uh, this is a segment in which Jack and I uh, go over some of the most recent issues of the day and uh, try to figure a few things out of why things are happening the way I, they are. Now, I brought in, I was doing a little reading online and otherwise, and, and I just came upon four different topics, all sort of related, but nevertheless, uh, all, all uh, associated with what we're doing here on the show. Um, so this is the recommended reading section, and, I, and we're <coughs> going to uh, hold up a few articles, and Will's going to put the URL up for you, and, and, and this is just recommending that you read this stuff. This is from the Financial Post, uh, in which they talk about uh, the headline says, Cries of Rank Hypocrisy as Disclosures Reveal BC Government Pension Funds Invest in Kinder Morgan. Well, surprise, surprise. So here we have the provincial government that has $18 million of pension funds invested in Kinder Morgan. So draw from that what you may. They think it's uh, terrible that the premier is doing that, destroying our economy. Of course, here on our show, we're wondering exactly who, who the guy's working for. Uh, the second thing I'm recommending for you to read is uh, from the TIE. And uh, it was a recent article about energy facts, about exactly where the what Canadians are doing with uh, their energy and how we're how we're using it, and uh, how we rank up uh, with uh, consumers around the world, and basically that that's not good news. Canadians are huge energy consumers. I'm not going to get into too much of it here, but it also gets into tax bases and who's getting money from the, the energy sector, and it shows that, of course, Alberta government is so concerned about their economy and how much it's going to fail, but less than 5% of their tax base is actually related to the oil industry. So it's, it's another, another very good article to read. I just get the facts on how money is being spent on energy. A third item I brought in is uh, from Arthur Furstenberg from the Cellular Phone Task Force. And uh, this is a good news article. And basically, New Mexico has rejected smart meters, the BC Hydro consumer meters that we were all being uh, subjected to here in British Columbia. And around the world, everywhere. Yeah. All of Canada, of all course. of the United yeah. States. But here in, in our province, we went through this and how we couldn't make a case. And I'll just read a couple of three things here, Jack, because it's so, so damning. They just said the company did not demonstrate that smart meters will save money. Now we found that out in British Columbia. Smart meters didn't save a penny. It cost us, you know, a couple of billion by now, as they keep swapping them out. Uh, they didn't demonstrate that smart meters will produce energy efficiency. Uh, the company did not demonstrate that customers actually want smart meters. Uh, the company did not give the consumers any alternatives to smart meters. Uh, uh, the company did not address the con consumer privacy and on and on it went and they basically just said no the, the company did not make a case that they should have smart meters in new mexico and the commission there the utilities commission rejected it so they're not going to have smart meters in new mexico great well, for them. that is absolutely unbelievable that a state government had the i know courage and bravery and and uh, to actually do what people want i mean God, I wish we could have anything like that here. Well, you know, it's it's funny how that goes, and but I suspect that, you know, the the uh, corporate interests don't have their uh, their hooks around the mechanisms quite the way they have them here in British Columbia. And my last thing I want to bring out is that uh, I got a message from Democracy Watch. Uh, it's a fantastic organization here in Canada. Duff Conacher is, uh, is the director of Democracy Watch, which is a spin-off of uh, Ralph Nader's efforts in the United States. And basically, this is a great article talking about all the problems with how democracy is supposed to work and how it's not working. And they list several reasons why the governments have to create legislation to protect uh, the public's right to having fair, free and fair elections and to be treated fairly. I'm not going to read through the article, but I just recommend to go to Democracy Watch, 
uh, read that article. You'll find it very, very interesting. And again, I think this is a good news story where there is an organization in Canada that's just doing a lot of great work to protect our interests. So after, after all that, Jack, uh, I think we should get back to talking about a few other the local issues again. Uh, of course, proportional representation is still, uh, we're still waiting for the provincial government to get this uh, campaign going. Uh, they're supposed to be in favor of proportional representation, though we haven't heard too much about that. And uh, I see you brought in something here from uh, an editorial in the Sandwich News written by well, our this, good friend this Tom is, Fletcher. Yeah, this is written by Tom Fletcher. I think this is probably right through all the, uh, all the David Black newspapers, which are right around the province. And it's just an attack on proportional representation. And I mean, it's just... Non I, I think it's a mixture of nonsense and misinformation yeah. and some, just some stupid insults. He says, uh, we've got a green party, we've got a green leader who throws tantrums. I mean, what kind of thing is that to say? Uh, I mean, and then he, fi he, he, he finishes off his third or fourth paragraph here, just at the beginning. He said, if you like this kind of terrible behavior he's talking about, we've got you know, everything is a disaster, he says. If you like that, great, because Premier John Horgan is doing everything he can to make sure fringe parties are elevated permanently into the legislature through some formula of proportional representation. Now, we're starting to see in the media a growing attack on proportional representation. Why is that? Is it because the media is so concerned for democracy and for the well-being of the people of British Columbia? No, it's because the corporate media represents the corporations who do not want proportional representation because proportional representation is more democratic. And the last thing the corporations want is any democracy because right now they run everything. So if you run everything, if you have the power, why would you want more democracy? Proportional representation is not a panacea. It's not going to, but it's a big step that can take us in right directions. And for me, it's very disappointing that here we are now, almost the middle of May, the ballot that we're going to vote on was supposed to be out at the beginning of April. We've wasted month after month, and now it, there may not be the ballot until the fall. We've, wait, we're wasting months, I think quite deliberately, where people could be learning about and talking about proportional representation. What are the benefits? What are the cons? What are the, why would we want it? Why would we want to keep the system we have now? Just an intelligent discussion led by the government and an honest media that is working in our interest just to inform us but we have none of that we're really in a terrible terrible situation this little problem on on this this vote for proportional representation is just a microcosm of the power that's arrayed against us yeah. and you know we're just seeing it come out with with stuff like this well this to me it's like uh the campaign is on. The people that don't want proportional representation, who basically own the media, their campaign's on. They can get away with saying all sorts of ridiculous things like we were reading in the paper. And uh, there's no other response to it. We're the, what are we waiting for, uh, Premier Horgan? Uh, and also his caucus, they should be pressuring him, saying, listen, this is a, one of the biggest issues facing us today. It's what got us into government, promising that we're going to have this, by the way. It's not just a side issue. Uh, whether or not we have any type of democracy in this province is, is hinging upon starting this process of proportional representation. I think that's, not, as you say, it's not the end all, the solutions here and everybody can go back to sleep. No, it's a process. So Jack, I mean, what do you think, what's the importance of them releasing the referendum question now for us? What, what do you think the advantages would be if we knew what they were going to be, uh, we were going to be voting on in the fall? Well, I think that was supposed to be the kickoff of the whole campaign, was when the ballot was out then, people would know what, what, what options we would have to vote for, and uh, people would start talking about the various options, and the public could begin to start learning about the various systems. 
instead, you know, the weeks and months are going by and, you know, people have the right to know about something about proportional representation. What are the pros and cons and what are the weaknesses? Just, we should know that and we don't. So how can we intelligently vote, which I think seems to be the plan. It seems strange too that, I mean, <clears throat> every single liberal is opposed yeah, the Liberal Party. Uh, every single NDP -er is supposed to be in favor. I mean, th doesn't it all seem kind of odd that the that can't they just kind of give that facade up and just open this right up to a real discussion as citizens? Yeah, just an intelligent discussion. Yeah, are we are, are the NDP whipping everybody into not saying anything nasty about it or not saying anything about it? That's the other thing is that why aren't MLAs just going out and having you know, public forums and having discussions and, you know, having groups and yeah. trying to figure this out. Well, let's try to get somebody from the Green Party to come on our next show. Yeah. And because the Green Party has also been involved in preparing this ballot and we can try to find out what's going on. Yeah, and maybe we can get an idea of what that question is going to look like. I think it's so important to have that. So anything else on your mind today, Jack? <sighs> You know, I mention every couple of weeks that California is using fracking wastewater to irrigate their food crops, and um, including organic crops. And the reason I kind of got into this was the oranges I used to buy, the organic oranges I was buying, I guess a year ago, started tasting like poison. Yeah. So I'd heard the rumor and I checked into it on Google. And if you find check into it on Google, you will see that yes, California is using poisoned fracking wastewater to irrigate their crops because they're short of water down there. And nobody even tells us, except us on this show, yeah. but nobody seems to care. Well, it's interesting that you actually tasted it. I mean, a few years yes, ago, it was I actually, uh, heading home Friday night, stopped at the local uh, grocery store and bought a uh, wild salmon. Took it home and threw it on the barbecue and I thought, oh, this is going to be nice. I was cooking away on the salmon and uh, it was a nice pink color. Uh, but the thing is, it never changed color. And it never really changed in texture or anything as it cooked. I cooked it. I tried to figure, you know, so soon this is going to get flaky and it looks like it's ready to eat. So I didn't like that. So I threw it in a bag and I took it back to the store. And what I found out was, well, lo and behold, it wasn't wild salmon, it was farm salmon. And the thing is that really, truly, it's the same thing. The taste test tells you, this did not taste like salmon. It didn't taste like fish to me. And is that what we're getting now uh, on our plates? Uh, when they say ocean wild, that doesn't mean anything. It's still farm salmon. So you bought something that you said, was it labeled wild? Yeah, I like the, I, I should be yeah. fair, I should yeah. go back and look at yeah. the words yeah. they use because it was so tricky that in fact you'd say, oh yeah, I guess maybe, you know, but, but there was no indication of that. And I actually had asked at the meat counter, is this farm salmon? And they said, no. So that was the thing that really got me. But when I went back, the manager had a different, uh, different story. So they told you it was not farmed salmon. That's right. Where was this? Uh, I'd rather leave that off. But it's uh, the thing is that the, the issue is, is that I could taste it. It wasn't. I wasn't. I'm not a really fussy guy. But man, that was not something that I would want to eat. It was just simply did not taste uh, like it was appetizing in any way. Canada has now become the first country to allow the sale of a genetically modified salmon. The first country in the world to allow the sale of this really untested yeah. thing. It's, being, it's, it's, it's in the market now. Um, the Trudeau government did it in complete secrecy. The, there you go. Well, well on that happy note, yeah. on the eating of salmon note, just be cautious what you're buying at the store, folks. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks.